the average serial killer is responsible for 10 deaths. That's a huge body count. So how many did you kill in Los Angeles? Los Angeles, uh, approximately 20. September 1982, Samuel Little was on trial for two murders, but he was surprisingly acquitted. This proved to be a big mistake, as Little went on to become the most prolific serial killer in US history. Here are the most famous serial killers of all time. A judge in Miami today followed the jury's recommendation and sentenced Theodore Bundy to die in the electric chair for the murder of two co-eds. January 1974, Ted Bundy brutally assaulted Karen Sparks, marking the beginning of his downward spiral into a life of serial killing. Born November 24, 1946, in Burlington, Vermont, Theodore Robert Bundy was an infamous serial killer raised by his maternal grandparents. Growing up, he believed his mother, Lewis Cowell, was his sister, but in 1951, his mother or his sister would take him to Tacoma, Washington, marry Johnny Bundy, and Ted would take his stepfather's last name. Bundy was said to be very intelligent and charming, but would struggle with his feelings of isolation and exhibited troubling behaviors, though nothing that would immediately indicate the horrific violence he would later commit. Bundy attended the University of Puget Sound before transferring to the University of Washington, where he studied psychology and thanks to his charm, he led an outwardly normal life. But beneath the surface, his darker impulses were growing. January 4, 1974, Bundy's violent tendencies escalated. His first known attack occurred when he assaulted Karen Sparks in Seattle, leaving her with lifelong injuries. This marked the beginning of a series of abductions and murders across several states, including Washington, Oregon, Utah, and Colorado. Bundy often lured women by pretending to be injured or posing as an authority figure, using his charm to gain their trust. Once in his control, he assaulted and killed them, sometimes desecrating their bodies afterward. His crime went largely unnoticed for a time, as he carefully maintained a cool demeanor. But in August 1975, Bundy was arrested in Utah for failing to stop for a police officer. In his car, police found handcuffs, a crowbar, and other incriminating tools tools, marking the beginning of his downfall. Despite being in custody, Bundy managed to escape twice. The second escape on December 30th, 1977, allowed him to flee to Florida, where he would commit his final murders. January 15th, 1978, Bundy broke into the Shy Omega sorority house at Florida State University, brutally attacking four women and killing two. At approximately 2.45 a.m., Ted Bundy entered the house through the rear door with a faulty locking mechanism. His first target was Margaret Elizabeth Bowman, who he bludgeoned with a piece of oak firewood as she slept and then struggled her with a nylon stocking. Bundy would then move on to the next room, where he brutally beat Lisa Janet Levy, leaving her unconscious. The assault continued with strangulation, mutilation, and sexual assault with a hair mist bottle. In the adjoining room, two more victims, Kathy Kleiner and Karen Chandler, were also attacked. Kleiner suffered a broken jaw and deep lacerations, while Chandler endured a concussion broken jaw, lost teeth, and a crushed finger. Miraculously, Chandler and Kleiner survived the ordeal, crediting their survival to the timely illumination of automobile headlights that would frighten the attacker away. And just a few weeks later, he abducted and murdered Kimberly Leach. But the wheels of justice were already turning, and it wasn't long after these murders before Bundy was caught. February 15, 1978, Ted Bundy was arrested for the final time in Pensacola, Florida, after he was pulled over by Officer David Lee for driving a stolen car. Interestingly, as Lee was taking him to jail, he had no idea he had just arrested one of the FBI's 10 most wanted fugitives. Bundy's trial, which began in 1979, drew national attention. The trial was covered by 250 reporters from five continents and was the first to be televised nationally in the US. Bundy chose to represent himself, displaying an arrogant belief in his own legal skills as he claimed he was innocent. He was calm and confident as he cross-examined witnesses and argued legal points, but his efforts ultimately failed. I'm not asking for mercy. 
for I find it somewhat absurd to ask for mercy for something I did not do. July 1979, he was convicted of the Shy Omega murders and sentenced to death. A few months later, he was convicted of Kimberly Leach's murder, receiving another death sentence. Throughout the trial, Bundy captivated the public, especially women, many of whom were inexplicably drawn to him. And because of those good looks and charm, many women would attend his trial, write him letters, and express infatuation. Bundy received marriage proposals while on death row, illustrating the disturbing fascination held by certain individuals, despite the gruesome nature of the crime. And as his execution date approached, Bundy finally confessed to over 30 murders, though many believe that number could be a lot higher. January 24, 1989 After many years of legal battles and appeals, 42-year-old Bundy was executed in that electric chair at Florida State Prison. I didn't ever want freedom. Frankly, I wanted death for myself. May 27, 1991, Jeffrey Dahmer drugged and assaulted Conorak Synthosomphone with the intention of killing him, but Synthosomphone escaped. However, what happened next is as shocking as it is unbelievable. Now, Jeffrey Dahmer was an American serial killer. Born on May 21st, 1960, in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, from an early age, Dahmer displayed troubling signs, including a fascination with dead animals, which he dissected and preserved. This odd interest of his marked the beginning of a twisted lifestyle, as he later became known as the Milwaukee or the Milwaukee Monster. Despite these early warning signs, his childhood appeared somewhat normal to outsiders. His parents, Lionel and Joyce Dahmer, had a strained marriage, eventually divorcing when Dahmer was 18. The unstable home life, coupled with growing feelings of alienation, contributed to his increasingly disturbing behavior. In 1978, Dahmer graduated from high school, and on June 18th of that same year, he committed his first murder at the age of 18. Dahmer picked up a hitchhiker named Stephen Hicks and lured him back to his family home in Ohio. After a nice drink, Dahmer bludgeoned Hicks with a dumbbell and strangled him. This marked the beginning of Dahmer's murderous spree. And after killing Hicks, Dahmer dismembered the body, threw it in acid, and disposed the rest. For nearly a decade, he wouldn't kill again, but the compulsion never left him. In the years following his first murder, Dahmer struggled to maintain a normal life. He briefly attended Ohio State University but dropped out due to poor performance. 1979, he would enlist in the U.S. Army, but his alcoholism led to a discharge two years later. By 1981, Dahmer was living with his grandmother in West Allis, Wisconsin, where his behavior would become even more erratic. He would be arrested in 1982 for indecent exposure and again in 1986 for lewd and lascivious behavior, both incidents foreshadowing his later crimes. November 1987, Dahmer committed his second murder. He met 25-year-old Stephen Toomey in a bar and lured him to a hotel room where Dahmer claimed to have no memory of the murder, waking up to find Toomey dead. He dismembered that body, disposed of the remains in a similar fashion to his first victim. This marked the start of Dahmer's escalation, where his killings became more frequent and brutal. Between 1987 and 1991, Dahmer murdered 15 more young men, luring them to his apartment with promises of money or alcohol. His method typically involved drugging his victims, strangling them, and then engaging in neck Dahmer also began experimenting with cannibalism, consuming parts of his victims to feel closer to him. His desire for control and possession extended to his attempts at creating living zombies by drilling into his victims' skulls and injecting acid in an attempt to subdue them without killing them outright. By May 27, 1991, Dahmer came close to being caught when one of his victims, Connor Axenthosomphone, managed to escape. Dahmer had drugged and injured the boy, but he fled that apartment, where two women found him and called the police. When the police arrived, Dahmer convinced them that Synthosomphone was his adult lover, who had simply had too much to drink. The officers, not noticing the severity of the boy's injuries, returned him to Dahmer, 
who later killed him. You can imagine how many people criticized the failure of law enforcement here. July 22, 1991. Dahmer's final victim was 25-year-old Tracy Edwards, who he lured to his apartment. Unlike previous victims, Edwards managed to escape and flagged down two police officers. He led him back to Dahmer's apartment, where they discovered photographs of dismembered bodies and other disgusting evidence of Dahmer's horrific crimes. Dahmer was arrested on the spot, and subsequent searches would reveal human remains, including skulls, bones, and preserved body parts. Oh, the sheer horror of what was found shocked the world. Dahmer confessed to 17 murders, detailing his methods with chilling detachment. That I did what I did not for reasons of hate. I hated no one. I knew I was sick or evil or both. Now I believe I was sick. While his defense team attempted to prove his innocence on the ground of insanity, Dahmer was found legally sane and guilty on all counts. February 17, 1992. He was given 16 consecutive life terms, amounting to 941 years in prison. Dahmer wasn't given the death penalty because Wisconsin had abolished capital punishment in 1853. However, just two years later, Dahmer was killed by fellow inmate Christopher Scarver while serving his sentence at the Columbia Correctional Institution in Portage, Wisconsin. Scarver, who was also serving a life sentence, attacked Dahmer and this other inmate with a metal bar while they were cleaning a bathroom. Now, his death came after he survived a previous attack with another inmate, who tried to slit Dahmer's throat with a razor embedded in a toothbrush while he was sitting in the prison's chapel. Dahmer's death was met with a mixture of relief and frustration, as many believed he had escaped true justice by not sitting in there a while longer. I got away with numerous murders of women in my life over a span of 50 years. September 25th, 2014, Samuel Little was convicted of three murders. Unknown to the police, this was only a small fraction of Little's entire crime spree, which never came to light until he started confessing. Born June 7th, 1940, in Reynolds, Georgia, Samuel Little's considered the most prolific serial killer in the history of the United States by the number of confirmed victims. His early life was marked by instability, raised primarily by his grandmother, and he claimed that his mother was a sex worker, though this was never confirmed. He would move frequently throughout his childhood, which would lead him to a lack of structure, and without the proper father figure, he led a life of petty crime from a young age. And by his teenage years, he was already in trouble with the law, setting the stage for a life defined by violence and crime. 1956, Little dropped out of high school and started drifting across the country. He was first arrested at 16 for a B&E. That would be the first of many brushes with the law, as he'd get arrested dozens of times over the following decades for crimes ranging from theft to assault. Now, despite these arrests, Little often managed to avoid serious consequences, serving relatively short sentences before being released back into society. The exact start of the killing spree is unknown, but it is believed to have begun in the early 70s. Little targeted vulnerable women, many of whom were marginalized, including workers, drug addicts, and even the homeless. This helped him evade detection for a long time because the public and law enforcement didn't really care about these people. Yeah. <laughs> I don't go back to the same city sometimes and uh -huh. pluck me another green. Uh -huh. <laughs> I, I mean, green, so y'all got on to find him. Mm, for sure. That one, right? There's a good one. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's that. a good one. He would typically lure women into his car, drive them to remote areas, and then him. Unlike many serial killers, he just killed with his hands, which left little forensic evidence behind. Now, September 1982, Little was arrested in Pascagoula, Mississippi, for the murder of 22-year-old Melinda Rose Laprie, a woman who had gone missing earlier that year. Interestingly, while under investigation for the murder of Laprie, Little was extradited to Florida and tried for the murder of 26-year-old Patricia Ann Mount, whose body was found around the same time. However, despite multiple witnesses and physical evidence tying him to the crimes, Little was not convicted. The cases were dropped, allowing him to continue his killing spree. 
The failure was a devastating oversight, as Little would go on to kill more women across the country. Over the next several decades, Little roamed around the U.S., committing murders in many states, including Florida, California, Louisiana, Texas, and Ohio. Now, despite being arrested for various crimes, including kidnapping and sexual assault, he continued to escape significant prison time. His quiet lifestyle and the nature of his victims made it difficult for authorities to link him to the murders or even recognize that they were the work of a single killer. Little's modus operandi, which involved strangling his victims and leaving few signs of struggle, often led coroners to misclassify the cause of death as drug overdoses or natural causes. By September 5, 2012, Little was finally arrested in Kentucky on a narcotics charge. It was this arrest that would ultimately lead to his downfall. While in custody, Little was linked to three unsolved murders in LA from the 1980s through DNA evidence. The victims, Carol Alford, Audrey Nelson, and Guadalupe Apodaca, had all been struggled in a manner consistent with his methods. On January 7, 2013, Little was extradited to California to stand trial for these murders. During the trial, Little continued to deny any involvement, but the evidence was overwhelming. September 25, 2014, he was convicted of three murders and was given four consecutive life sentences without the possibility of parole. While Little's conviction marked the turning point, the full scope of his crimes wasn't yet known. In November 2018, while serving his sentence in a California prison, Little began confessing to additional murders. Over the course of several interviews with Texas Ranger James Holland, Little provided chilling details about his killing spree. He confessed to murdering 93 women between 1970 and 2005, offering precise descriptions of his victims and the circumstances of their deaths. Sam had an extraordinary memory, even sketching portraits of his many victims. His confessions led investigators across the country to reopen dozens of cold cases, with over 60 of the murders confirmed by law enforcement as of 2020. In fact, this is the largest number of confirmed victims for any serial killer in United States history. On November 9, 2018, the FBI officially confirmed Samuel Little as the most prolific serial killer in U.S. history, surpassing even the notorious ones like Ted Bundy and John Wayne Gacy. What makes Little's case particularly shocking was how long he managed to evade capture. His victims were often women from communities considered the minority, and their disappearances were free frequently overlooked or not thoroughly investigated. Little himself admitted that he deliberately targeted women he believed wouldn't be missed. Despite his confessions, Little showed little remorse for his crimes, instead displaying a detached, almost boastful attitude when discussing the murders. Yeah, you got pretty good at knowing which ones. Still, I'm not going to go over in the white neighborhood and pick out the little uh, young teenage girl or like the just do. His chilling lack of empathy and sheer number of victims make him one of the most terrifying killers in modern history. December 30th, 2020, Samuel Little died in a Californian prison at the age of 80. Although California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation sources indicate no cause of death, Little suffered from diabetes, heart problems, and other health conditions. Now his death brought an end to a reign of terror. Many of his victims might never be formally identified, and some cases remain unsolved. Samuel's ability to avoid justice for so long raised serious questions about the failures within law enforcement and the treatment of marginalized communities. A California killing spree that's captive, captivated the world for decades. Now a group of sleuths claims to have solved the case of the infamous Zodiac Killer. December 20th, 1968, Betty Lou Jensen and David Arthur Faraday were found dead on Lake Herman Road in California. The terrifying truth is that a vicious killing spree had just begun. Operating in the late 1960s, the Zodiac Killer bestowed this moniker upon himself, a name that would be synonymous with terror and cryptic communication. December 20th, 1968, Betty Lou Jensen and David Arthur Faraday had a date together and drove to Lover's Lane on Lake Herman Road in California. Around 11.05 p.m., an unknown assailant pulls up to the couple's car. As he approaches their vehicle, he fires several shots towards him, hitting various parts of their car. The couple were unhurt at this time and try to escape through the passenger door. 
But the situation took a deadly turn. As Faraday tried to get out of the car behind Jensen, the assailant shot him in the head with a 22 caliber rifle. The horror didn't end there. The assailant then chased Jensen, firing six shots at her, hitting her in the back five times. He then fled the scene in his vehicle, leaving no evidence behind. What followed next was a series of taunting letters and cards, which the killer sent to local newspapers. In the letters, which often started with, this is the Zodiac speaking, and signed with the crosshairs of a scope, the Zodiac killer unleashed a wave of threats, promising further bloodshed and devastation unless his messages were published. Within these chilling correspondence, the killer embedded cryptograms and puzzles. Among the chilling proclamations was his declaration of collecting victims as eternal slaves for the afterlife. A 50-year-old mystery was recently solved when a group of intellectuals decoded a message from the Zodiac Killer. December 5th, 2020, a breakthrough was made in deciphering one of the four mysterious codes created by the Zodiac Killer dubbed Z340. In the decrypted message, the Zodiac explained that he wasn't afraid of the gas chamber, as he believed it would only send him to paradise sooner. After the team submitted their findings to the FBI, the decoded message unfortunately gave no further clues to the identity of Zodiac. While two of the four ciphers remain unsolved to this day, the cipher that has confounded investigators to this day is one he sent with an audacious message. This is the Zodiac speaking. By the way, have you cracked that last cipher I sent you? My name is... And next was a sequence of 13 symbols, meticulously encoded and believed to represent his elusive identity. January 29th, 1974, the Zodiac Killer sent his final letter after going silent for nearly three years and claimed responsibility for 37 murders. While there are speculations suggesting a wider scope of his operations, the Zodiac Killer is only officially responsible for five murders in the Bay Area, alongside two attempted killings. His choice of victims were often couples in secluded areas near San Francisco. In fact, only one of the survivors of the Zodiac Killer was able to describe the attacker. The victim was attacked on the hillside of Lake Berryessa, alongside his companion, who didn't survive the encounter. The Zodiac Killer was described to be wearing an ominous black executioner's hood and a chest piece bearing a distinctive crosshair symbol, synonymous with his name stitched in white. And that's the same symbol from the letters between 1969 and 1974. October 2021 marked another turning point in the Zodiac's case, as a team of cold case investigators thought they found something. This team had 40 law enforcement professionals, journalists, and military intelligence officers, believing they had really made a breakthrough in identifying the elusive Zodiac. The team, known as the Case Breakers, concluded that Gary Francis Post, an Air Force veteran who passed away in 2018 and resided in the Sierra foothills, was the culprit. However, it was eventually debunked. Amidst the other multitude of theories, there is only one suspect who was officially identified by authorities, Arthur Lee Allen. He was a former elementary school teacher and convicted sex offender who passed away in 1992. It has been 52 years and the case remains unsolved. As investigations persist, the Zodiac Killer remains one of America's most notorious serial killers. Would you enjoy it while you were doing it? Uh, that's the worst part of it. I mean, they didn't plan. <laughs> I know better life did not worry. Restless. November 15th, 1957, Bernice Warden disappeared from her hardware store in Plainfield, Illinois. The disappearance was just one of many, as the police soon discovered. Born August 27, 1906, in La Crosse County, Wisconsin, Edward Theodore Gein led a life that was eventually marred by a series of horrifying acts. To fully understand what was going on in the mind of Edward Theodore Gein, we first have to go back to his childhood. Those early years were marked by hardship and dysfunction as he faced the challenges of an alcoholic father who died in 1940. 
and a verbally abusive mother. Despite the tumultuous dynamics within his family, Gein developed an unsettling idolization of his mother, a fascination that would have far-reaching consequences. May 16, 1944, his older brother Henry met a mysterious fate during a devastating fire that engulfed the surrounding area. Although his brother's death was concluded to be an accident, there were speculations that Henry was perhaps Ed's first murder victim. This was because Henry would always stand up to his mom, something Ed never did. Now, following his mother's death a year later, Gein became a loner. November 15, 1957, Edward Theodore Gein came under scrutiny of the police following the puzzling disappearance of Bernice Warden the owner of a local hardware store. Suspicion fell upon Gein when it was discovered that he had been in the company of Warden shortly before she vanished without a trace. Law enforcement officials, driven by their growing concern, made their way to Gein's farm to conduct a thorough investigation. Little did they know they were walking into what would seem like a scene from a horror movie. Within the confines of Ed Gein's property was the lifeless, decapitated body of Bernice Warden, hanging by her ankles from the rafters after she had been shot. In addition to this were various dismembered body parts. In fact, the remains of Mary Hogan, a tavern keeper, who had vanished three years beforehand, were also found, among a host of other grim discoveries. November 16, 1957, Ed Gein was arrested, and shortly after, he openly confessed to the authorities that he had sourced the majority of the body remains and his skin paraphernalia from three nearby graveyards, and that he had exhumed only corpses that bore a resemblance to his beloved mother. Gein also admitted to the gruesome murders of the two women found in his home, both of whom he claimed bore an uncanny resemblance to his mother. However, when confronted with the charges, he entered a plea of not guilty because of insanity. A few days after his arrest, a thorough psychological assessment further deemed Ed Gein mentally unfit to stand trial. After he was diagnosed with schizophrenia, on November 7, 1968 though, he was declared fit to stand trial. Ultimately, Gein was pronounced guilty only for the murder of Bernice Warden amidst a string of alleged crimes. The courtroom's verdict was also overshadowed by the revelation of his disturbed mental state at the time of the offense, and he was never convicted for the murder of Mary Hogan. Consequently, he found himself back in a mental hospital, a place that would become his final home until his eventual passing on July 26, 1984, at age 77. With as many as 40 bodies discovered in his house before it was burnt to the ground in 1958 in a mysterious fire, the true extent of Gein's crimes may never be known. And when he was questioned about the motives behind his heinous crimes, all he said was that he wanted to make a woman's suit that would allow him to assume the identity of his deceased mother and inhabit her very skin. The man who committed what may be the crime of the century. His name is John Wayne Gacy. May 10th, 1968, John Gacy was given 10 years in prison for sodomy, but was released just 18 months later. Unknown to authorities, they just released the notorious serial killer, paving the way for Gacy's future crimes. 1972, John Wayne Gacy's reign of terror unfolded and was marked by the brutal torture, rape, and murder of 33 young men and boys. His moniker as the killer clown encapsulates the horrifying reality of his heinous acts. What sets Gacy apart is the chilling revelation of his depraved mindset. Even during his legal proceedings, Gacy confessed to his lawyers without remorse that he viewed those he preyed upon as not human beings. Gacy's childhood and seemingly normal life offer a perplexing insight into the horrors he later unleashed. Although he experienced a turbulent relationship with his father, who was described as strict and physically abusive, Gacy strived to forge a path of normalcy in his early years. In September 1964, Gacy got married and ventured into a seemingly conventional adult life. He also became the manager of three Kentucky Fried Chicken restaurants in Waterloo, Iowa, owned by his wife's father. However, in that same year, at the age of 22, he already had two homosexual experiences. Interestingly, Gacy goes on to become an active member of the local JC's chapter in Iowa, 
He immerses himself in the fabric of his community and generously dedicates his time and effort to the organization. May 10, 1968, the pretense of Gacy's normal life shatters when he faces his first arrest and was indicted on a sodomy charge. He was accused of sexually assaulting the son of a local politician and a fellow JC. The revelation sent shockwaves through those who knew him, particularly his wife. Well, she immediately filed for divorce following his 10-year sentence and took sole custody of their two children. Gacy was granted parole after 18 months of incarceration in 1970 and returned to Chicago to stay with his mother. There, he would enter into the construction industry and remarry. It was around this time that Gacy started living his notorious nickname, The Killer Clown. The moniker stemmed from his unsettling persona within the community. Adopting the alter ego of Pogo the Clown or Patches the Clown, Gacy regularly dressed up in clown makeup and attire for children's parties, really blurring the line between jovial entertainment and the darkness that lurked beneath. The clowning was relaxation for me. I enjoyed entertaining kids. December 11th, 1978, the disappearance of Robert Peast proved to be the catalyst that led to the unmasking of John Wayne Gacy's heinous crimes. As the last person known to have seen Peast, Gacy became the prime suspect in the investigation. However, nothing prepared the police for what they were about to discover as a subsequent search warrant unearthed the grim reality hidden within Gacy's house. The police uncovered 29 bodies of young men and boys buried under his house while four more were found by the nearby De Plains River. December 21, 1978, Gacy was arrested and confessed to deceiving or forcing his victims to his house under the pretext of being a policeman or with promise of a job. With his alter ego being Clown Axe, he would then go on to put them in handcuffs, claiming that they were just fake to show them magic tricks. These young men would then endure to assault and the ultimate fate of being gagged with their own underwear till they died of asphyxiation. During his trial, Gacy tried to escape a guilty verdict by pleading innocent by reason of insanity, which was rejected by the jury. People don't want to know the truth and the, and the honesty of it. Fine, then go ahead and kill me. But vengeance is mine, say it the Lord, because you will have executed somebody that didn't commit the crime. And though he claimed to have lost count of his total victims, he was convicted of 33 murders, which he committed between 1972 and 78, and was sentenced to death. May 10th, 1994, John Wayne Gacy was executed by lethal injection in Stateville Correctional Center. Serial killer stalking young couples on Lover's Lane, but it isn't fiction. It's the real deal, a legendary predator that people in Texarkana have always known as the Phantom Killer. During the spring of 1946, the peaceful twin cities of Texarkana, Texas and Texarkana, Arkansas were gripped by terror. A shadowy figure dubbed the Phantom Killer, also referred to as the Phantom Slayer or the Moonlight Murderer, haunted the community with a series of brutal crimes. February 22, 1946, the Phantom Killer's spree began when he targeted young couples parked in secluded areas. His first victims, Jimmy Hollis and Mary Jean Larry, were assaulted at gunpoint, with Hollis sustaining a severe head injury and Larry assaulted with the barrel of his gun. News of that vicious attack spread like wildfire, leaving Texarkana residents on edge and fearing for their safety. Over the following weeks, the Phantom Killer struck again and again, preying upon innocent victims under the cover of darkness. The town was gripped by panic, as people locked their doors and kept watchful eyes on their surroundings. Despite this, the killing went unabated. Meanwhile, with no one but the first victims, Jimmy Hollis and Mary Jean being the only ones who could describe their attacker, the police had nothing to work with. As part of his M.O., the Phantom Killer also donned a mask, which was described as a burlap sack with eye holes cut out, leaving only the unsettling sight of eyes peering through the rough fabric. As the number of victims grew, law enforcement agencies struggled to piece together the puzzle. Despite extensive investigations and countless leads, the Phantom Killer managed to elude capture, leaving behind a trail of fear and despair, as there were eight confirmed attacks with five dead victims. 
All the police could piece together was the pattern with which the killer operated. The Phantom had calculated intervals of approximately three weeks between each chilling attack. The weapon used was a 32 caliber gun, with one instance involving a 22 caliber. The killer also usually targeted young couples in secluded areas on the city's outskirts. In this effort to protect themselves, the citizens of Texarkana took extreme precautions. Curfews were imposed, and residents armed themselves, hoping to ward off the elusive and menacing figure haunting their town. While about 400 suspects were apprehended and questioned, with some remaining in custody for a while, no one was actually convicted for the killings. May 3, 1946, the phantom spree eventually came to an end. His final known attack left his last victim, Virgil Starks, dead. To this day, the true identity of the phantom killer remains a mystery. However, there were speculations that a certain Earl McSpadden was either the phantom killer who committed suicide in 1946 by jumping in front of a train, or he could have been the sixth victim. This is because subsequent investigations revealed that McSpadden met a grim fate, as evidence suggested he was murdered using a sharp object before being deliberately positioned on the tracks. The tale of the Phantom Killer also became the inspiration for some movies, video games, and books, with the most iconic of them being the movie, The Town That Dreaded Sundown.